Alex backed away, waiting his chance. Then he ducked a wily, swinging punch and dropped him with a left hook to the side of his chin. This time, Maxie didn't even try to get up. He sat there nursing his jaws, hoping nobody would interfere and help him back into the fight. But no one bothered. They had all fallen silent. Finished? Alex said quietly. Maxie shook his head, but it wasn't to say no. Alex dropped his fist and offered Maxie a hand up, but Maxie pushed it away. Chuckling to his feet and staggered up through the crowd. Everyone started cheering Alex, who was trying to pretend it was all in a day's work, but he couldn't have a grin spreading across his face, even though it hurt to smile. Toby handed him his jacket. Without a word and he slipped it on, Believe shut his book and came over. Thanks, Alex, he said. I wish you'd get into a few more fights when I could retire. This knot will have never known. He walked away, whistling happily, the only person who had really made a profit from the fight. Alex finally managed to greet him up. His enthusiastic supporters and disappeared into the locker room. Toby found him there a few moments later. Bathing, bathing him faced with cold water, he glanced at Toby in the mirror. Look what that animal's done to my face, he said. Mm, says Toby. Is that all you can say? demanded Alex. What's the matter? You didn't have a bet on Maxi, didn't you? Toby shook his head. Don't be stupid, he said cheerfully. Oh, that was beautiful. Poor Poti. The hook to a wrist, the stress punch, then power. One left hook and it's all over. I'm glad you enjoyed it, said Alex. He returned to face his friend. Look, Toby, I'm sorry about the cake. If I'd seen to Maxi earlier, it wouldn't have happened. Oh, that, said Toby irony. That doesn't matter. But your sister's schedule getting married tomorrow, said Alex. What are you going to do? Toby sighed. Alex, you always underestimate me, he said. I told you before, I'm a professional. So what? Well, a professional always has a second string to his bow. Then at Alex baffled gaze, look, when the army made the cake for Brissette and sweating, they didn't make just the one. They had to spare in case anything happened. You mean you got another one? Alex demanded. Of course, said Toby. I made one at home and one at school. Remember, I told you I wasn't happy with the icing on the school one? Well, I was planning to share the cake at break time on Monday. Oh, said Alex, taken aback. Well, I'd better be going, said Toby. I a busy day tomorrow. There's your paper route early. Then there's the wedding, then your thing. Oh, yes, dry. I'll see you in the afternoon. Alex said, Say, Toby, why didn't you tell me about the second cake earlier? Don't be so thick, said Toby. You wouldn't have a, had a reason to see to Max you then, would you? Bye. Toby gave him a brief smile and went out through the door, leaving it swinging. Chapter 19 Professional Athletes At 6 o'clock in the morning, it was cold. The breath from the group of girls in front of the main door was misted in front of them. Mariana was standing on the chama going through a series of bending and stretching exercises while another handful of girls were standing talking to Miss Clegg. At last, Miss Clegg looked at her quad and clasped her hands. It's just about time, girls, she called. Samantha Stevens isn't here yet, says Man Mariona. We can wait a month longer, Mariona, said Miss Clegg. She's probably decided to stay in bed. 
Algar and her her aunt and Marina broke up as the front door opened and Samantha came down the steps, dressed in her gray tracksuit, hoping we gone. Marina demanded, "That's right, superstar," said Samantha, levelly. Miss Glick took her aside. Now, Samantha, you've been given permission to go out of the gate, but you're to try to and stay with the others. Understand? I'll try," said Samantha. "Yes, but when it gets too much, I shall stay with you, not the others. Right? Good. I could do with the company," said Samantha. "Shall we get on with it? I'm cold." Miss Glick gave her an uneasy glance. Then she shrugged and snatched the clothes. To the side gate, which she unlocked her with her master key. Okay, girls, it's exactly six miles from here around the cross and back to the main gate. The caretaker should have them open for us by that time," said Miss Glick. <laughs> she glanced at her watch again and put her whistle to her lips. Peep, the, the and they went up. Mariola immediately went to the front and set a good serving place that was designed to take out any beginners. The others ran in the path just behind her, and Samantha settled in at the back with Miss Clegg running alongside. Samantha was running earlier, breathing through her nose. It wasn't true that she was feeling cold. She'd been stretching for her last half. An hour in her room. Gradually, they strung up. Mariana stretching her knees until at three miles, she was some thirty meters ahead. Samantha didn't mind. She was biding her time. At last, the sigh from the ste- steep hill came up, and Mariana dug deeper into her shoulders as she neighbored up the incline. This was what Samantha had been waiting for. She st- sidestepped, Miss Clark. And accelerated past the park. Mariana was breathing hard now, her weight telling on the hill. And Samantha passed her like she was standing still. Come on, Mariola, Samantha urged. Get those fat legs moving. Show me what a professional at least is. Then she was in front and pulling away as though she were in a different year. Miss Clark. Taken by surprise, as Samantha suddenly moved, came up level with Mariola. Samantha, she gasped out, but it was pointless. Samantha was almost out of earshot, and they all knew she wasn't going to stop anyway. Mariola tried to burst, forcing her tired legs into a sprint, but after only fifteen meters, she staggered up to the side and halted. Miss Clegg gave her a. We blew big lines as she went past. Samantha shot over the brow of the hill and down to down the other side. There was an island with four rows up it, and waiting at the, the island was Alex. He was sitting astride, his pie and holding Roberta is group for Samantha. Everything's okay, he asked as she came jogging to a halt. Fine, she said. Taking hold of the bike and to throwing her legs over it. Why the the sunglasses? Disguised, he said as they paddled up down the London road. Did you have any trouble getting away? No, she said. No trouble at all. It was four thirty, and lovers pairs of sketches were scattered all around the Coliseum. Every Buddy was waiting while the ice was resurfaced before the free dance competition. Gradually, the auditorium was filling up. Hardly anybody came to watch the repetitive compulsory dances. In the corner of the end room, Alex was sitting in a chair while Shu renews the makeup that covered the publicist from his fight with Maxi. Samantha was standing watching. A cross look on her face. The door opened and Toby came in eating a hamburger. Hey, well done, you two," he said. "I've just heard. I didn't think you were going to make it," said Alex. "I've been here for hours," says Toby. "I had to go to the 
coffee first, didn't I? Sorry, I wasn't thinking," said Alex. "I missed my lunch. Remember?" said Toby. He turned to Samantha. "How are you, Sammy? How is feeling to be on the run?" Samantha ignored this. "Look at this moron," she said. "They think I'm dancing with the bride's father. You ought to see Marcy," grinned Toby. "You might at least have left. It's still Monday. Put it through." "I had waited long enough," said Alice. Pity you can't skate in such glasses, isn't it? Said Samantha caustically. I wouldn't have minded, but you gave me the word you wouldn't get into any fights over me. Ah, breathed Toby, understanding at last. Was why? Yes. So now you know," said Alex, "and you can keep your mouth shut about it. I don't fancy sketching with someone who looked like he been." In the road accident," snapped Samantha. "If I don't mind what Marcy said about me, why should I, you?" Alice turned to Samantha. "It wasn't over you. It was over something else, right?" "Keep still," rapped Shrew, pushing Alice back in his seat. "How much longer?" Alice demanded of her. "You put much more on, and they won't know which is me and which is Samantha. I know about makeup," said Sue. I've just got the eyes to do. No, said Samantha suddenly. Did the eyes? You're not serious, said Sue. He looks like something that Dracula's just bitten as it is. Alex turned to magnificent black eyes on Samantha and nodded. No, she's right, he said. Leave the eyes. All right, said Sue. That is. Then you're finished. Alex got to his feet and Sue brushed. His poor black costume, down with a close brush, he stood still as she did so. A resigned expression on his face. Was that true? Samantha demanded of Toby. About the fright not being over me. Absolutely, said said Toby. He grinned. They had a misunderstanding about a culinary arrangement. That's all. Oh," said Samantha, looking put out. She noticed the expression on her face and deliberately changed the subject. "How was the wedding, Toby?" she asked. "Awful." "Did your mom cry?" asked Samantha. "No, she laughed," said Toby. He rubbed his hands together gleefully. "Up." "Ah,、uh, so did I. I just think she'll never come clattering up my kitchen again." She, fi- she finally stood back and regarded Alex. He made quite a startling figure, with his white powder face outlining the sober black eyes. "You do, you do," she said. "Thanks, Sue," said Alex. He gave her a quick kiss on her cheek. On the cheek. "You saved me a seat," asked Toby. "Of course," said Alex. "You're sitting my." By me and Paula," said Sue. "Who's Paula?" asked Toby. "A friend of Samantha's," said Sue. "Now we better leave these two alone. They're going to suicide themselves up. It will be at least an hour before Alice and Samantha were on again. They were in first place after the compulsory dances, so would be going on. As for the free dance, even so, they needed to start getting." Their minds in order for the ordeal ahead. They sat close together, not speaking, not even looking at each other, but somehow communicating in that eerie way that only perfect partners can understand. Long as Alice stood up, still without a word, and helped her to her feet, slowly they made their way down the corridor towards the ice. Samantha, a quiet voice said. She got a start. Her parents were standing at the entrance to the tunnel. There was a long frozen moment until Anne felt he was about to scream. Then Samantha ran forward and put her arms around her mother. "Did you see me skate?" she said quietly. "Yes, darling. It was wonderful." "You were both wonderful," says Miss Stevens. She felt Samantha's forehead. "You're sure you're feeling all right?" I'm fine, mummy. Honest," said Samantha. "How did you know I was here?" "Because I'm your mother, darling," 
said Miss Stevens. It hardly came as a surprise when Miss Jones called. We just had to look through a copy of Sketching Chance to find out where you were. Oh, said Samantha in a small voice, and I thought we'd been so clever. She knelt up, go up her mother and faced her mother. I'm sorry, Daddy. He shook his head. It's all right, sweetheart. He said gently, just as long as you're okay. You're not going to send me back there, are you? There's not another point, is there? He smiled. I don't suppose you they have to anyway. Oh, Daddy, she ran forward and flung her arms around him. Don't cry, Alex said suddenly, speaking for the first time. Samantha, you hear me? I'm not, she said in the sleepy voice. It's just I couldn't give a damn, he said, not in his normal character. Leave it till afterwards. John make your eyes pick up run. Samantha stared at him and suddenly no one else existed for them. The bond between them was so strong it was almost a physical force. The bond was that was going to take them dry to the stop. And as she gave a nod and held down her hand to him. Let to his, she said. Chapter 20 Sketching on the Edge The dark, almost awesome figure of Alex stood down in the middle of the ice alone. The huge cloak was strapped around his arms in front of him. His face sunk out of sight in the collar. The crowd craned forward, wondering what was happening. There was a dramatic pause, and the familiar theme music to Cloak and Jagger came over the main speakers, provoking cheers from the younger members of the audience. The music grew louder and louder, and still, the figure didn't move until at last, with a train of tempo, his head came slowly up, the dark eyes standing out, startling in the glare from the night, and then he moved, long flowing steps, the cloak billowing around, around him. Smoothly, he sketched the lines of the eyes and around the far end until finally the arms opened and out of the folds of the cloak appeared the small figure of Dagger gleaming in her silver costume. And now everybody's eyes were on her, and she picked up the temper of the dance, spinning and shunning, dodging around but always with Alex just behind her, the black cloak acting as a framework and background for her sketching. The music took from around the eyes as they explored the theme of the most popular film of the year, the story of two teenage Grand fighters in the Victoria, an era that has surprisingly caused the imagination of people everywhere and time to perfection, whose theme music had just read number one on the trust. Their sketching speeded up along with the music, the dance portraying images and feelings, searching for clothes, hunting violence, then finally to fight, clothes split darker up and with those important style swings, seemed to be using her as a weapon. Then she was back on the ice again, dodging and ducking, bullets, throwing down on one skirt, turning quickly until Alex whooped in with his bullet broke close to protect her. The music reached its searing crescendo, taking them back to the middle of the ice. And now everybody who had seen the film knew how it was going to end as Alice enfolded her in the cloak again, and she disappeared from the star, leaving him once more standing there, alone. The crowd, who had been getting a little bored by the other similar free dances, went mad. Toby was, went even madder, his voice drifting right across the eyes. After a long pause for effect, Alice let her go again and they glided towards the sidelines when at least their old coat was sitting, not applauding, but just sitting there, a contented smile on her face. Toby was still going strong. Paula looked up at him in, in embarrassment. Then Mars went up and she thought he would burst a blood vessel. 
She dragged him back into the, his seat. Does that mean they won? Bella shouted in Shu's ear. I should think so, said Shu. I haven't had time to do the math yet. Because they won. Bella probably Paula lost her grip on him and he climbed back up onto his seat again. Paula spake a head full of peanuts out of her hair as well. He had scattered them in his excitement. Does he always be like this? She asked Shu. Well, easily, smiled Shu. But you ought to see him when it's a spot he really likes. In the back rows, Miss Stevens fell for her husband's hand and gave it a squeeze. Back on the, the eyes, Samantha was doing exactly the same with Alex. She looked up at him and shouted about the noise of the crowd. Do you remember the ending of the film? Eh? Uh, Alex said vaguely. He was trying to pick Toby up in the crowd. The ending of the film? She repeated, giving him a shake. What about it? He looked down at her. I told his sister. I screamed and shook her head. No, I don't remember that. I'm sure he did, said Samantha innocently. Well, I suspect your drive to Udoli are. said Alice. I suppose we should try and get the thing to July. That's what I was thinking, said Samantha, linking her hands behind his leg. Just for the sake of a curiosity. Of course. Yes, said Alice, bending forward, just for the sake of accuracy. About the author, Nicholas Walker was born in the United Kingdom and has managed to do quite a few interesting things. Mr. Walker studied law and banking. He ran glass and hotels. He even ran a restaurant when he was only 21. At present, he runs a charity club but he spends his free time cycling, parachuting, ice skating, and riding. Mr. Focus lives with his wife and two children in Penzance, England.